So, so the guideline says I have to repeat the question, which is, if GCC told us a lot of stuff, would this be a good thing? Well, the answer is yes. Um, one of the things that really bugs us is um, we don't have a good way to check for overruns on the stack, um, really, because there's no information from which we can distinguish um, alloc you know, local variable extents on the stack. So if GCC told us, it, for, well, if GCC could put some spaces in between local variables and lay them out with those spaces in the right order and then tell Valgrin somehow where those spaces are, then we can paint them red when the thing, you know, when you enter the function. It'll be expensive, but it will check up, find um, overruns on the stack. So yeah, that would be good. Um, I don't know what the chances of that ever happening are, but that would help. Well, I mean, the, the chances are good. I, I'm sure that if somebody wants to submit a I don't know how hard it would be to develop such a patch for GCC, have, never having messed around with it. But you could always send one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Yes, there was an effort. No, I don't really think it went anywhere, but also I don't really know. Um, we, we got, I think it was Jeff Dyke was pushing this along, and he, we got a lot of complaints about signal handling and Valgrind is broken and stuff, because UML does all sorts of weird shit, as far as I can see, really pushing its luck. Um, I, I don't think it worked out, but I don't know either. I mean, yes, it would be great, because then you could obviously do at least some kind of kernel checking up. Yeah. Well, it, it depends how your MPI implementation works. If you're just doing kind of low performance MPI in which you transfer data by doing system calls, read and write, then there's no, there's no big deal because data you know, comes in through read, is painted as defined, and then you're okay. The problem is if you have a high performance MPI implementation which um, shoots data direct into user space, like the uh, Quadrix stuff, or uh, there's various others, then, as far as Valgrind is concerned, suddenly that you're picking up this data which um, is uninitialized and it starts shouting all over the place. So, what is in construction is a bunch of wrappers for the MPI um, API, uh, you know, MPI read, MPI write. Um, and these uh, effectively tell Valgrind how MPI read and MPI write modify memory. So it can then paint memory um, accordingly. You can also do buffer checks on input. So if you say MPI, sorry, MPI send this buffer and it's like contains garbage or is not addressable, then it'll tell you at that point, which I think is kind of nice. Yeah. It takes a lot of pissing around with instruction sets. What what are you thinking of? Okay, what has to be done? You you need to write an instruction decoder which takes your instructions and turns them into this common intermediate language. And that, that's often well that basically that's a big and difficult thing to do because instructions do all sorts of weird things and you have to simulate them quite exactly. How many operations are in these How many operations? Well, we have sort of primitive operations like add, subtract, multiply, and then we have all the floating point stuff, and then we have all the vector stuff. So it's actually quite a large intermediate language. It's sort of small in a way. Uh, the, the, you have simple stuff for load stores, 
reading and writing simulated registers, uh, contr some control flow stuff, um, arbitrary expression trees, and then in the expression trees, you have about 300-ish different kinds of operation that you can do. We have to have that many. I mean, even for x86, you get a lot. It's, a, it's an SSA-based intermediate representation, if that means anything. So to hold it to a new architecture, you probably have to write on the order of 25 to 30,000 new lines of code. And to make it work reliably on open office size programs, then that is another interesting problem. Because you, you don't want your simulator to be slightly broken and 100 million instructions ago it did something wrong and now the program crashes, well, you can never find out what happened so, or why, so you have to be quite careful. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way to do that? You mean you want, to see, uh, you want a stack trace which goes from C into Python yeah. and then... The, the, the C stack trace, if you do a bunch of Python calls, this can be interpreted. Sorry, the C stack, stack trace gives you a bunch of what calls? It gives you a bunch of calls from the C API that Python has. Right. And, uh, in a running program, I'm using GDD, for example, you can interpret these as Python stack. Really? tell you that we don't have support for constructing Python frames in stack traces, but it's interesting that GDB can do it, so, you know, maybe we could also know how to find out how to do that. There's no support for that right now. It's just a standard stack trace. I don't know what you get, some stuff that goes into the Python interpreter or what. Yeah, pretty much. It attempts to do that. Or at least it takes the foot top, you know, 40 frames or however many you ask for, up to 100 stack frames. I mean, it takes a stack snapshot every time you do malloc or free, so um, it can get quite expensive if you take these giant stack frames all the time. Especially if you're doing a lot of mallocs and frees. Yeah. No, for the most part, it doesn't see library boundaries. It just, the only boundary that is really of significance is the kernel boundary. And to some extent, um, the, mal the, you know, the malloc and free entries in glibc are treated specially. But, you know, when one random library calls another random library, it doesn't see any difference. In, in 3.2, we have the ability to wrap any function with um, some other function that you supply. So, you know, suppose here is some function entry into the library which you're interested in. Then you can write a wrapper which, when you call there, it actually runs the wrapper, does some checking of the arguments, calls the original, comes back to the wrapper, and then returns. So you, that's how the MPI um, wrappers are implemented. Uh, that's why we have that functionality to some extent. Uh, so you could do that. It would be some effort, but it's certainly possible if you have some special library you want to do special checks on. Yeah. Sorry. I can't, I can't hear you. Can you say that? Speak louder.